Three friends are excited to experience the caving trip they had looked forward to all summer, but things turned deadly. William didn't know what happened at first and thought they had already left the cave. Then he hit his head deep below ground and had no idea that he was in a gruesome situation. William Coughlin was 27, an oak forest environmentalist and camping enthusiast. He loved being outdoors and spent most of his time with his friends in the woods and near bodies of water. His mom, Marge, said William had a special affection for feral animals. He took a job with the Federal Environmental Protection Agency because of his desire to protect the environment. He got into caving later in life after being introduced to a small cave near his home by a friend. They entered the cave and explored the whole thing within a couple of hours. They went off the central part of the cave without equipment and had no issues managing the cave. This experience gave them confidence to explore more technical caves. Also, they had not heard of any caving accidents, so they figured nothing wrong could happen. He knew nothing about caves, but was fascinated that he had a whole new world to explore underground. Although William and his friends were inexperienced cavers who knew little about the activity, they were dead set on finding a cave that could give them a challenge. His friend James recommended that they take a trip to City Cave, Kentucky, where they had various cave systems. Cave City is a unique tourist destination in that it offers visitors two areas to explore, above ground and below ground. There are shops, restaurants, museums, and other attractions on the surface. Below the surface lies hundreds of miles of cave systems that cross the Kentucky landscape. They chose Buzzard Roost Cave in Cave City because it was the one that caught their attention the most in the brochure. Buzzard Roost Cave is a tourist cave minimally developed and marketed as not a beginner cave because of the deep drops and tight squeezes. You have to pay full attention to what you are doing because many places throughout the cave can cause serious injury or even death. It has sharp stalactites and stalagmites, which may not be dangerous in itself, but add that in to an uneven slick cave floor and you have a good chance for an accident. This would be the group of friends first organized caving trip. William was so happy to go on this trip because he wasn't the type to have planned adventures that required him to leave the 100 mile radius of his home. The element of danger excited them, and they knew that if they conquered a challenging cave, they would have something to be proud about. They were willing to do something dangerous if it meant they could have the thrill of their lives. On Friday, May 28, 1993, William and two friends, James Jacala and Kevin Feely, traveled from Illinois to Cave City. This trip happened to fall on Memorial Day weekend, there were hundreds of people exploring the shops, restaurants, museums, and other attractions, but they were only interested in the hundreds of miles of caves that were now available to them. While in Cave City, the friends read the brochure that advertised two tours available to the public at Buzzard's Roost Cave. The brochure described a historic tour and a wild cave tour. The historic tour provided guided viewing of readily accessible areas of the cave, in contrast, the Wild Cave Tour, which the brochure described as appropriate for the more daring visitor, provided a guided exploration of undeveloped areas of the cave and required crawling, twisting, and squeezing through the lower passages of the cave. They chose to take the historic tour because it was happening first. Before embarking on the tour, all three signed a release form that consisted of the dangers of the cave and the release of liability from the cave operators if anything bad were to happen. Each caver did not have his own form to sign, but instead signed one document passed amongst the group. They may have voluntarily signed the release, however, the dangers of the cave were not shared with William and the group. William did not know of the risks inside the cave before signing the document. Thus, the group relied entirely on the tour guide and the cave operators for their safety instead of their expertise and their familiarity with caving. In 1998, Kentucky General Assembly passed a statute. The law mandates that a cave owner shall not be held liable for injuries sustained by a person using the cave for recreational or scientific purposes if no charge has been made. 
This is a significant law. It means that if you don't charge for people to enter your cave, you cannot be held liable if they get hurt. This law helps cave owners generally to relax about the possibility of being sued. However, when someone charges money for people to use their cave or land, they become a business and different laws apply. William and James wanted to enter the cave after learning about the risk, but Kevin Feely decided to sit out and spend his time above ground at the attractions. They both completed the historic tour with a cave guide, Dave Hardin, and then elected to participate in the Wild Cave tour offered that afternoon. William, James, and four other people paid the guide to conduct the Wild Cave tour. Now the guide asked each caver to sign another release form with language identical to the one they had signed previously. Before the tour began, the guide gave the group two handheld flashlights. He instructed the group members that he would lead the exploration and that each person should navigate the cave in the same fashion as the person in front of them. They must stay together and not break off from the group until the tour is complete. He explained the risks of the Wild Cave tour and showed the tourists the kinds of tunnels they would be crawling through. He gave them every opportunity to back out, almost to the point of talking them out of it completely. He wanted to clarify this cave tour would be very different from the first one and that the danger was significantly increased. William and James had all the confidence in the world at this point and there was no way this warning would deter them from the thing that they were looking forward to the most. However, when the tourists all said they were up to the challenge, the group was surprised that more equipment was not offered for the exploration. Experienced cavers agree that helmets, extra food and water, and at least three light sources are needed for a cave of that difficulty. They made their way into the cave, and the group enjoyed working their way through the twists and turns of the passages. There was a sense of excitement and fear for William and James, and adrenaline was pumping through their veins. They made it to the halfway point without any issues, and it seemed like the cave was not as complicated as they thought it was going to be. However, they wanted more of an adventure, and they hoped the second half would be more of a challenge. The guide gave words of encouragement to the group as they started to make their way to the lower parts of the cave. This is where the technical aspects of the tour started to present themselves. After crawling through a tight passage of the cave, the group reached a 30-foot hanging cable ladder with wooden rungs. The guide called out to the group that this was the first ladder. The group descended the ladder and crawled a short distance and then reached the second ladder, a 15 to 20 foot hanging cable ladder. Although shorter, the second ladder was more challenging to navigate because it hung over a rock protrusion, making it difficult to grip the rungs adequately. Shortly after the group descended the second ladder, the guide announced that the official tour had ended and the group was free to explore the nearby passages. Before the group began exploring independently, the guide told the group that they were running behind schedule. He then left them at the bottom of the ladder, telling them that he would leave the cave to make a quick phone call. William wanted to go back to climb that second ladder and enter a passage that caught his eye earlier in the tour. James agreed that this was a good idea and thought they might find an unexplored part of the cave. William grabbed the ladder and started to climb. He was tired. The ladder was not steady, making climbing it a challenge. In addition, the ladder was not meant to support someone of William's size. He was 6 feet and about 220 pounds. He was starting to get frustrated and decided to take a quick break from the ladder and wait for the guide to come back and help him before making a second attempt. James asked the other two group members if they could try to find the guide because he was gone for an extended period of time. After waiting for a while, the guide did not return and William decided he would give it another shot. He got on the ladder and made it about halfway up when he started to get nervous about falling. Then he lost his grip and slipped off the ladder. During the fall, he hit his head on a rock that jutted out from the cave wall, fell several feet and landed on his head, which began to bleed profusely. James could not believe what he just witnessed and quickly ran to William to help him. James examined William's head and discovered a two-inch gash on his scalp. 
Another group member heard the commotion and ran over to help William and realized he was conscious but was not making any sense when he tried to respond to their questions. William didn't know what happened at first and thought they had already left the cave. When he realized how injured he was, the panic set in and James did his best to calm William down. James told William that he was okay and that he would get him out of the cave safe. The tour guide returned and told James they would only get out of the cave if they climbed the ladders and left the cave the same way they came in. Unfortunately, William was in no condition to leave the cave and was delirious. He was injured badly and the group was concerned he would not make it out of the cave. This infuriated James and he started to argue with the guide, telling him that they needed the cave rescue to get William out. The guide stood firm and told James that he and the group would have to work together to get William out of the cave. James suspected the guide didn't want to cause panic by calling for a rescue operation because there were so many people above ground at the attractions. The group agreed at this point the only option was to get William up the ladder and out of the cave. They worked together pushing and pulling William to get him up. Everyone was surprised when they were able to accomplish this first major hurdle. The struggle would be getting him through a narrow, claustrophobia-inducing V-shaped passage that if you did not navigate carefully, you could get wedged in and become stuck. The passage was rough with sharp edges. It was hard to get a grip because of the sharp rock, but there was no way of getting past this in order to get out. It is primarily belly crawl size and undulates up and down before taking a decisive turn to the left and downward. William went in and entered the tight passage head first. He was barely able to crawl through and was nervous about getting stuck. He was very large for the passage he was in. None of the people in the group were William's size, so when they came into the cave through this passage, they were not afraid of getting back out. Only William knew that he barely made it through this passage the first time. He made it about halfway through when he realized he could not move any further. At some point, he could not move back out against the force of gravity. The others soon heard him yelling that he was stuck and needed help. He was stuck horizontally with his arm pinned underneath his body. The wedge propped him up, but if he fell deeper into the crack, he would become more stuck and almost his entire body could become inaccessible if he slid in further. The group tried pulling him from the other side, but the more they tried to get him out, the more stuck he became. James could not believe the nightmare that was unfolding right before his eyes for the second time. He grabbed William and used all of his power to push him out of the passage. This made William get more stuck to the point where he could barely talk or breathe. In this position, the lower organs compress the diaphragm and lungs, making each breath a physical chore. Also, in this position, the lungs could fill with fluid and William's breath was heard to be gurgly. The guide told James to go to the surface to get the cave owner and tell him about William's accident, which James did. At this point, it became apparent to James that the tour guide and the cave owner wanted to handle the matter without notifying the authorities. Unfortunately, there was no way William would get out without a significant mechanical pull system at this point. The guide then left the cave to grab a medical kit and alerted the authorities. As a result, Three crucial hours passed before medical and rescue personnel arrived on the scene. While the group was waiting for rescuers, an onlooker spoke of similarities between the sensationalized 1925 death of Floyd Collins, who had been trapped inside a small cave only a few miles from where this one was located. His slow, agonizing death made headlines throughout the country as huge crowds gathered outside of the cave amid a circus-like atmosphere. James did his best to comfort William, but knew that things had gotten terrible and he started to get scared that William would die stuck in the crevice. James began to realize that William was not responding to him any longer, and that was when he confirmed William was unconscious. Rescue arrived on site and began to revive William. They were confident they could get him out. The fact that William was angled downward made this rescue that much more difficult. They used chemical heat, blankets, and heaters to protect William from hypothermia. 
The temperature in the cave dropped to about 44 degrees Fahrenheit at this point. William was on his side with his arm pinned underneath him. His body filled the crevice preventing all attempts to access any part of his body above his shoulder. The rescuers helped the rest of the caving group leave the cave, but James stayed behind with his friend. The rescue crew worked to set up a pulley system to pull William out of the aperture. Once both haul lines were operational, the team began making the only real progress of the rescue. Unfortunately, the haul was pulling him upward into a tight spot causing William a lot of pain. He started to moan and grunt. Nothing was working, but they did not give up trying to get him out. They spent all of Saturday trying to get him free, until he was pronounced dead. This was 17 hours after the rescuers arrived. About 50 workers spent another 7 hours removing William's body, using ladders and rope to hoist him out of the cave. They brought him out at 2.30pm Monday, almost 3 days after when he first entered. Mike Swift, the Barron County coroner, said William died of compressive and positional asphyxia. Although he suffered from a contusion on the head, Swift said that trapping was the leading cause of death. According to Jim Birch, coordinator of the Bowling Green Warren County District Disaster and Emergency Service, some 200 paramedics, firefighters, cave explorers, and mappers worked at the scene. William's dad, John Coughlin, said the whole situation was like a comedy of errors that cost him his child's life. James said the worst part of the caving accident that took his best friend was the eight-hour drive home to Chicago. It seemed like an eternity for James. He couldn't believe that he came to the cave with this big adventure and then to return home one friend short. Since returning to Chicago, James said he has had nightmares of his friend falling. Kentucky State Police investigated William's death, the first of its kind in the area for over two decades. The Denver-based 10th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals found that the cave attraction owner had known too much about the dangers of the activity he was involved in for the estate not to get sued for damages, partly because of the clear waivers he signed. But in Coughlin v. TMH International Attractions, the court decided that as an inexperienced caver, the release read more as an incitement than it was warning of specific risks for William. As a result, William's family was awarded damages for the tragedy. I want to say thank you for watching the video and don't forget to subscribe if you like the content. As always, I would really appreciate it if you would be nice to the like button. And I have many other disaster videos on this channel that you might want to check out. See you at the next one.